I am stoked. Not only is this another painting session, it features Kuratake's Gonsai Tombi Art Nouveau watercolor set. It also turned out great, if I do say so myself. Uh, that's a call back to the previous video where I arted with the inks. <sighs> you had to be there. In this video, I use the line and wash or ink and wash technique. Hi, I'm Irene and this is Inkworks. Welcome to both new and returning viewers. If you're the former, be aware that while I do talk about the process, I also talk about unrelated stuff too. Don't want you to feel ambushed by the let me tell you about my dream portion later in the video. So after lightly drawing my design onto watercolor paper, I used one of my favorite fountain pens to line it with Sketch Ink Lily from Roar and Klingner. I really need to get a couple more colors from that series. I've used Lily a lot because although it's dark, it's not like a boring black. It's got nuance. Plus, it's waterproof, which is important for line and wash arting. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. But I'm at the point where I'd like more waterproof inks, and the Sketch Ink series has like 10 different shades. Of course, Roar and Klingner isn't the only option for waterproof inks. For example, Diatramentus has a line of document inks, and I've found Noodler's Lexington Gray to be pretty waterproofy given enough drying time. The reason for this particular design? My mind has been on letter writing. Not that I'm a correspondence champion, but I did manage to send two whole letters in the past six months. Two? Anyway, that got me thinking about those old-timey portable writing boxes. Yes, they were used in Victorian times, but they actually go back to the late 1700s. Traditionally made of wood, they carried writing instruments and related paraphernalia, such as pens, inks, papers, seals, and wax. It also provided a flat working surface. Perhaps for those delightful carriage rides where every rock on the road meant an illegible scrawl and a nib in the eye. Writing boxes ranged from basic utilitarian to fancy schmancy pantsy. They were an essential item for every shady merchant, bumbling explorer, scurvy sea captain, and smutty novelist, all writing letters left and right for centuries. And they're still made today, or at least something similar. Galen Leather, for one, offers their version of a writing box in leather and walnut for, I believe it's $150. I've yet to purchase from that company, but I've heard lots of good things about them. Not wanting to clutter the piece, I kept the text to a minimum. So I'll explain what each section represents. At the top left is a wax seal. It's used to press an image or a monogram onto melted wax, which then hardens and secures your missives. The receiver would know who it was from by the design of the seal. If it happened to be broken, you'd know the courier was a spy or a gossip monger. Either or. I wonder how many Snoopy Snoops ended up decapitated because they just had to peek. The top middle compartment holds the wax sticks. 
They come in various colors with a wick inside that you light to melt the wax. Alternatively, you can use small wax pellets with a metal spoon. I haven't played with seals and wax, but I was given a small set some years ago. The packaging is nice, so I've kept it on display, but I really should tear into it. The top right corner has sticker sheets, specifically little floral ones, to embellish your correspondence. Below those are sheets of letter paper and coordinating envelopes. Bottom middle holds a stack of postcards, perfect for a short message reminding people you're still alive and kicking. Not that they're concerned. I mean, would it kill them to write back? Bottom left is where postage stamps are kept. I know the scale doesn't match, but I didn't want to get too detailed there since it was already looking a bit busy. Above that is a handy dandy address book. Looking at it now, maybe I should have added a diary lock. Yeah, I think that would have looked nice. And smack dab in the center are a handful of fountain pens nestled in their own felted slots. You might be wondering, but Irene, where are the bottles of ink? Well, I for one am not comfortable with the idea of toting around large amounts of ink. So just imagine those pens are fully loaded and they'll have to last until the next refilling opportunity. The first layers were pretty watery because I wanted to leave certain areas light, but also because I wanted to build up with more layers in other areas. I didn't take any notes on the specific colors used. Pretty sure it was only five or six for the entire piece, though. On a recent episode of the Goulet Pencast, one of the topics touched on was cursive writing and if it should still be taught in school. Well, I don't have a strong opinion on that controversy. I learned both printed letters and script letters in grade school. To this day, I use both in everyday writing. In fact, the forms are so ingrained that there are times when one word will be in block print while the next is in cursive. But that might be a sign of laziness more than anything else. The point is, I'm not sure why cursive has to be dropped, unless it's a matter of, hey, there's only so much learning we can fit in a school year. It sounds like some people consider cursive to be a dead form of communication. Is it though? Especially when so many of our original historical documents are in that form. Cue a mental image of Minas Tirith's archives, where Gandalf flips through Middle Earth's Second Age parchments, eventually throws up his hands and sighs. I guess we'll never know. Look, all I know is I often write in cursive, whether it's for brain dumping, note taking, or personal corresponding. We had a visiting relative last week, so we went on an excursion to Seattle. It took half the day and there was a lot of walking involved, but I'm not complaining because it was a highly enjoyable outing. We had my favorite sort of weather, mid 60s Fahrenheit, overcast and threatening to rain, but not quite getting there. We traversed Pike Place Market from end to end, including the lower level, because we can't not visit the magic shop and Golden Age collectibles. 
We also took a bunch of steps down to Alaskan Way for the sole purpose of checking out Pike Street Press. It's a neat little shop that provides custom printing services, yes, but they also sell cool notebooks, stickers, greeting cards, and stuff. I was hoping to find fountain pens and inks, so I was disappointed to see only a couple of Coeco pens and a few Rhodia pads. That was it. So although they have some neat things, don't go in expecting a fountain pen utopia. Yeah, I was a little bummed while trudging back up those steps, but at least we found the elevator part way that took us back to market level. It was a weekday, and one of the advantages of that is less crowding. Look, there's always a line for Poroshki Poroshki, but it was only a minute or two until we were inside and ordering. The nearby courtyard was full, so we crossed through to the waterfront side of the market and found a table to enjoy our splurge for the day. Smoked salmon, beef and onion, marzipan, and rhubarb piroshkis. Of course, they were all good, but we did agree the sweet and tart rhubarb was the bestest. By the way, parking was sort of tricky, so producer Mike dropped us off in front of the Sea Town restaurant because it's so close to the market. Well, the full name is Sea Town Rub Shack and Fish Fry, which, when I think about it too long, sounds like a pretty creative euphemism. But I'm sure that's just a case of regressive 15-year-old-itis on my part. Interestingly, there's a big tree in front of the restaurant, which is very attractive, but unfortunately, it's also a draw for birds. I'm not saying anything Hitchcockian happened, but there was an incident... Thankfully, Sea Town Rub Shack and Fish Fry were very understanding and allowed us to use their facilities for emergency cleanup. I felt like a right jerk for thinking puerile thoughts about them. Actually, it looks like a cool place, and the posted menu is very appealing. World's best wild sockeye salmon burger? Yes, please. <laughs> one of these days. Sea Town is one of Tom Douglas's eateries. He's a locally famous restaurateur with like eight businesses in the area. The only one I've eaten at is Serious Pie, which was seriously good. Yeah, it was a fun week, not counting the whole hot water issue. It was no fun having to tell our week-long house guest, on day one no less, that our hot water heater had tanked. I won't go into details, but I will say that after water valve training 101, we endured four days of eye-poppingly brisk showers, daily drip bucket dumpings, and the delightful, if it's yellow, let it mellow, lifestyle. Of course, when my sister called recently, I couldn't help but brag about our thrilling brush with off-grid living. Until I remembered, she and her husband had to spend the entirety of winter in a trailer on a mountaintop with no running water, only limited power, and no internet. Oops. Consider me chagrined. Are you still here? You're really curious about that dream, aren't you? Well, buckle up, Buttercup, because here it is. I was inside a fancy bakery, which was itself inside a shopping mall. Believe me, that detail comes into play later. 
The shop was gorgeous with dark wood finishes, shiny brass details, and plenty of glass cases displaying a variety of cake and pastry artistry. Well, for once, I was flush. Seriously, the cash was overflowing my pockets. So as I perused the offerings, I pointed out what I wanted, and workers pulled them off the shelf, creating a pile of goodies just for me. There were other customers, but I simply pushed them out of my way, as one does when one is rich and on a mission. Moving along the aisles, I selected tiered cakelets, prettified petty fours, and a plethora of pastries, such as glistening fruit tarts, crimped bulging hand pies, mountainous cream puffs, and elegant eclairs. I was in paradise and wanted to never leave. But before I was done, it was mall closing time, and the workers who were attending to me suddenly switched gears and began their closing procedures. I was all, hey, hold on. Did you forget I've got buttloads of bucks to spend? No, wait, the gate won't lock that way. Here, let me help you. That's right, my retail training kicked in, and I helped them to close up shop. Only somehow, after pulling and securing the gates, I found myself surrounded on all sides in what was essentially a 4 by 4 gated box. I watched as the workers left for the night while shaking my cage and protesting, really guys, this is how you treat your potential big spenders? I had to stand there, staring at all the drooliciousness until the next morning, I presume. That's where the dream ended. So, thoughts? Was this a simple reminder that greed is bad? Or a more complex moral lesson on the hubris of unfettered consumerism? Or perhaps my subconscious was telling me to stop depriving myself and eat the Little Debbie oatmeal cream pies while I still can. It's fun to psychoanalyze. It makes me feel young again. I remember watching the TV series Happy Days back in the 70s. I thought it was so cool how there was an apartment over the family's garage. Our own garage was a detached, single-level structure with a single-car bay. Not that there was ever a car inside, that I can recall anyway. No just an old bed frame, a broken bicycle, several toolboxes, a push lawnmower, old paint cans, a couple of worn tires, a cracked kiddie pool, and very likely a bunch of spider's nests. Not a place you'd want to spend any amount of time in. Its most important purpose was to hold up one end of the laundry line. So the idea of a livable garage just blew my mind. Actually, I did not care for happy days. It wasn't particularly funny or clever, but it was what was on TV one night a week for 11 years. And that's not even counting the reruns. If you want to see an entertaining slice of 1950s American culture, watch American Graffiti instead. Yeah, technically it takes place in 1962, but that's close enough in my book. The double LP soundtrack to that movie was in our record collection as far back as I can remember. It was a fantastic set of popular period tracks. But what I loved most was the artwork of the car hop on roller skates holding a tray with a cheeseburger, french fries, and coke. Growing up, I rarely had fast food. So those occasions when my mom took me to our family doctor were both tiresome and fun. 
tiresome because we had to take the bus and sit in the waiting room, waiting and waiting for our turn as walk-ins. Fun because afterward we'd walk over to Jubilee for a Smitty Burger, fries, and if I was really good, a milkshake. I think that was mom's way of trying to make me forget our physician's last name was Payne. I kid you not, throughout my childhood years, I was examined and treated by Dr. Payne. Oh, he was nice enough, but the associations were wild because the pharmacy next door where we got our prescriptions filled was called Failure's. It's surprising how well adjusted I turned out. Once the painting portion was done, I felt the lines needed more definition. So I poured a little sketch ink onto the palette and applied it with a brush. I believe that was the final element. Splatter didn't seem appropriate, so I called it good. It's occurred to me that the phrase, call it good, might not be used much anymore. Basically, it means time to stop because it's good enough. In the end, how do I feel about this piece? This line and wash painting might be the most fun and satisfying project I've done in months. It actually turned out better than I'd imagined. So, two Fonzie thumbs from me. Ayyyy. I'm happy to share this project with you. I feel that after three videos featuring this particular watercolor set, the purchase has definitely been justified. Actually, I could have used any of my other watercolors, Da Vinci, M. Graham, Daniel Smith, etc., for this piece, and I nearly did. I even pulled out some pans from my drawer of watercolors before changing my mind and putting them back. The thing is, regardless of the end results, each and every time I've used Kuratake's Art Nouveau set, I've had a blast. Maybe it's the colors. Maybe it's the way they work together. Maybe I hit my head one too many times as a kid. The point is, centuries from now, when YouTube has passed into legend, someone's going to find my notes, blow the dust off them, attempt to read my cursive writing, and not learn a darned thing. Until next time, stay artsy, my friends.